you can learn a lot about a person by playing tennis with them. As a general rule, I have found that guys who are gentlemen on the tennis court are gentlemen in their off-court life as well. Conversely, I watched one guy display the worst athleticism I've ever seen while playing with his best friend. Later, I was not surprised when this guy abandoned his family and ran off with another man's wife. And then there's Frank Calhoun. Frank is a big guy, and he played soccer at Georgia Tech until he injured his knee. After an orthopedic surgeon repaired it, Frank switched to tennis. But he plays tennis like a soccer player, hitting powerful serves and hitting the ball into the net from the back line. But I can beat him. I like to go to the net and put pressure on him to hit it past me. Most of the time, he overdoes it and the ball bounces off the back line. And don't get me started on his rounds. Let's just say that when he chooses a line, he always prefers it to be in his favor. As a result, Frank always wants to play with me. He just can't lose to the little guy. I'm not small, I'm six feet tall. But I'm pretty skinny and wiry, which makes me small compared to Frank, who is three inches taller and 75 pounds heavier than me. Not surprisingly, I don't really feel like playing with Frank, but it's hard to avoid because we both live in the Eden Point neighborhood north of Atlanta. Since Atlanta is a big tennis city, our neighborhood was built around a clubhouse with a pool and lots of tennis courts. Since so many people play on Atlanta Lawn Tennis Association League teams, it's pretty hard to avoid someone like Frank. But the good news is that I play with a lot of very nice people. For example, my mixed doubles partner, Penny Pennington. I met Penny thanks to my wife, Melanie. Melanie is a Pilates instructor, and many people who live in Eden Point take classes at her studio, including Penny. Unfortunately for me, Melanie is not into tennis, but when she heard that Penny was looking for a partner, she introduced me to her, and for about a year now, Penny and I have been playing together. The club we were playing in today's match was in Stone Mountain, so I offered to drive Penny to save gas. Given the way traffic accumulated on Saturday afternoons, we allotted ourselves 45 minutes to get there. As she walked out of the driveway, I wondered once again why Penny was still single. Part of the reason was that three years ago she had lost her husband in a car accident. After a long period of mourning, one way she coped with her grief was to attend Melanie's Pilates class. Another way was to get back into tennis, which she had practiced in high school. The result of all this physical activity was a trim, slender, dark-haired woman in her early 30s. I expected a woman as beautiful as Penny to attract suitors like flies to honey. But she kept telling Melanie that she just hadn't found the right man. Hi, Penny. I greeted her as she opened my car door. Are you ready to get them today? She grinned. Don't doubt it, Michael. I've wanted a rematch with those guys for a long time. We were discussing our strategy for the match as I pulled onto the I-285 freeway, but I was interrupted by my cell phone ringing. Hey, Robert. You've got to be kidding me! No, everything's great here. Damn. Okay, we'll reschedule for another day. Penny gave me a perplexed look as I turned onto the next exit ramp and started heading home. That was our opponent, I told her. He told me it had just rained and the courts weren't playable. Atlanta is notorious for its isolated downpours, which can flood one area of the city, while just a few miles away, the sun shines brightly. Penny was visibly disappointed. Damn it, I was so looking forward to playing tonight. Look, I said, why don't we go back to the club? We can practice, and maybe there'll be someone there who wants to play. As I pulled up to the main entrance of Eden Point, I turned onto the road leading to my house. I just want to stop and pick up my check for this quarters club dues, I told Penny. I won't be long. I parked at the curb and rushed to the front door. I'd written the check last night and left it on the dresser, so I knew where to find it. But as I walked down the hallway, I heard sounds coming from the master bedroom sounds I wasn't supposed to hear. Oh, please do it again. Yes, like this. Oh! That was Melanie's voice. What the hell? I tiptoed down the hall and peeked through the door. Melanie was lying naked on the bed, her legs spread wide. A man was crouched between them, mastering her with his mouth and hands as she moaned and gasped. I felt as if I had been in a car accident. I was stunned. I couldn't move. I couldn't think. Everything suddenly changed, and I couldn't understand what was happening. Then the man stood up and lifted Melanie's legs high to facilitate penetration. No, this can't be happening, I thought, recognizing the figure of Frank Calhoun. I heard her moan as he entered her. Then she moaned, Oh God, oh yes, oh God! I jerked away from the door as if I'd been punched. 
It was too unbearable. My first impulse was to burst into the room and pounce on him. But what would that accomplish? I asked myself with despair. They've already cheated on me, and fighting him won't change anything. Besides, even if I manage to land the first blow, he's so much bigger than me that he could still beat me to a pulp. But I don't want him to get away with it. Standing there, I suddenly remembered that Penny was waiting for me in the car. Oh, shit. I have to get her home first before I can come back here to confront them, I thought. I walked back down the hallway and out the front door in a daze. I felt like I was going to throw up at any second. I looked up and saw Penny watching me through the car window. A moment later, I climbed into the driver's seat and started the engine. I don't know how I looked, but hardly well. Are you okay, Michael? asked Penny anxiously, looking at me. I couldn't speak. I gripped the steering wheel as tightly as I could, steering the car toward Penny's house. As I pulled up to the house, I put the car in park, and without looking at her, I said, I'm sorry, Penny, but I can't go with you today. What happened, Michael? What happened? she asked with growing concern. When I didn't say anything, she reached over and turned off the ignition, then took the keys, got out of the car, and walked to my door. I turned to her. I have to go, Penny. Please give me my keys back. No, she said firmly. Not until you tell me what happened. When I didn't say anything, she opened the car door and pulled me by the arm. You're not going anywhere until you come inside and tell me what's going on. Robotically, I got out of the car and let her walk me into the house. She disappeared for a second and returned with a glass of ice water. I absent-mindedly sipped from it while she watched me. When I set the glass down, she took my hand and squeezed it in hers. Tell me, Michael. What happened in there? Suddenly, all my resistance crumbled, and I leaned back against the back of her couch. I tried to speak, but my throat suddenly constricted again, and I took another sip of water. It was Melanie and Frank, I said tautly. She looked at me incomprehensibly. Go on, she said. They were there together, in our bedroom. They were, my voice whispered. She sighed. No! That can't be. Melanie would never do that. The image of the two of them came back to me with full force, and I felt a tear run down my face. I never thought she was either, I wheezed as the pain in my throat intensified. Could it have been something else, Michael? Could you have been wrong? She asked. I realized she was trying to help, but that didn't stop my anger. When I looked in, she was lying on her back. When I left, he started having sex with her. So tell me, Penny, am I wrong? She flinched at my angry sarcasm. I'm sorry, Michael. I wasn't doubting you. I was just hoping there might be some other explanation. More pain pierced me. And with Frank Calhoun of all people, said I angrily. How could she let that big baboon near her? I guess that explains why Frank started taking Melanie's Pilates class, Penny reflected. Did he take her class? shouted I. She never told me that. My anger was still simmering. Thank you so much for warning me, I said bitterly. Now Penny was in pain. That's not fair, Michael. I had no idea there was anything between them. I'm sorry, Penny, I said. I didn't mean to lash out at you. I'm just having a really hard time right now. She squeezed my hand. It's okay, Michael. I can only imagine how you must be feeling right now. I stood up. I have to go, I told her. I have to go back there and find out what's really going on. You're not going to do anything violent, Michael? No, I just need to get some questions answered. She squeezed my hand. Please let me know what's going on, Michael. And let me know if there's anything I can do to help. I thanked her and walked back to my car. As I drove home, I was terrified of what awaited me. I thought about all the questions I wanted to ask her and tried to anticipate her possible reaction. I expected tears, denials, and angry words. How should I respond to them? What about Frank? What if he was still there? I could feel the adrenaline rushing through my system. When I walked through the kitchen door, Melanie must have heard me because she came out to meet me. She was in her robe and her hair was wrapped in a towel. You're back early, she said cheerfully. How was the match? We got caught in the rain, I said in a choppy voice. Oh, I'm sorry you couldn't play, she said. I bet Penny was disappointed. 
I just stared at her. I didn't feel like making small talk. They called about the rain right after we left, I said quietly. She blinked, but her expression didn't change. I'm back in the house, I told her. My heartbeat sped up. I saw you and Frank together. Of the many scenarios I had imagined, Melanie's reaction was not what I had envisioned. I'm sorry you had to see that, she said evenly. Is that all you have to say? I asked incredulously. You cheat on me and you're sorry I witnessed it? You're not even going to apologize for sleeping with him? How long has this been going on? Don't you have any explanation? She crossed her arms and sighed. Sit down, Michael, she said, gesturing to the table in the breakfast room. I prefer to stand, I said angrily. Suit yourself, she said, and sat back in her chair. I stood, stunned by her complete lack of response. Look, Michael, we were going to tell you soon anyway, but I guess this is just pushing the timeline a bit. I'm leaving you. Frank and I love each other, and I'm going to move in with him. We're going to get married as soon as the divorce is finalized. I decided to crouch down without risking a fall. Before I could say anything, she jumped up and said, wait here, and then disappeared into our bedroom. She returned a few minutes later, clutching a stack of papers. She held them out to me across the table. It doesn't have to be acrimonious, she said. I don't even want any alimony from you. I took all the money out of our savings account, but it's only fair since I'm leaving you the house. It's a lot better than you'll get if we go to court, but it's fine with me if you sign the papers and let us all move on with our lives. I looked at the stack of papers. It was a divorce petition. Have you been to a lawyer yet? I asked in amazement. What about our marriage? What happened to the last 10 years we spent together? I'm sorry, Michael. I didn't plan this, it just happened. Just accept it, it is what it is. Deal with it, I shouted. Accept that my beloved wife is having sex with that asshole Frank Calhoun in our own bed? Accept that our marriage is over? She stood up. I'm disappointed, Michael. I was hoping for a more mature response from you. She turned and walked back to the bedroom. I sat at the table, looking at the divorce papers in front of me and trying to make sense of what was happening. If someone had asked me that morning, I would have said that I loved my wife and that we had a good marriage. Then this afternoon, I found out that she was leaving me for another man. Talk about cognitive dissonance! In the silence, I heard the buzz of a cell phone and then scraps of conversation. He saw us. As you'd expect. That would be good. When she returned, she was fully dressed and carrying an overnight bag and a set of cosmetics. Since you brought it up, I don't intend to stay here overnight. Frank is coming to get me. We'll come back on Monday when you're at work and pick up the rest of my things. So you're leaving just like that? That's the way it should be, she said. Fine, I said bitterly. What do you want me to tell our friends? She sighed. Look, Michael, Frank and I haven't done anything wrong and we're not going to hide like criminals. We're going to continue to have an active social life. In fact, tomorrow night we're probably going to a reception at Eden Point. You won't have to tell anyone anything because everyone will know about it anyway. At that moment, a horn sounded outside. Melanie looked out the window. Frank's here, she said. I'm leaving. Closing the door, she leaned in again and looked at me. Just sign the papers, Michael. The sooner you do it, the better it will be for all of us. Then she left. I don't know how long I sat there. Emotions flashed through me like the cars of a train rushing through a crossroads. One minute I was seething with anger. The next I was remembering happy times. And the next I was sad. I told myself that I had treated her like a queen, and then wondered what I had done to push her away. I'm better off without her, I repeated, until loneliness overwhelmed me. The beep of my cell phone startled me, and I answered it quickly. Subconsciously, I was hoping to hear Melanie's voice, but it was Penny. What's up, Michael? she asked. Not very well, I replied. She left me. I heard, she said. Did you hear that? said I in amazement. Where? How? I'm sorry, Michael, she said sadly. Frank was bragging about it at the club. Oh, shit, I thought. It's already started.
On Sunday, I called the captain of our men's team. There was no way I wanted to go out on the field. Sorry, Joe, I told him. You're going to have to cut me out of the lineup today. I have some personal issues to take care of. Yes, I heard, he said sympathetically. Sorry to hear about that. Good luck. I thanked him but knew I was only in for more bad luck. I spent the entire day in the house. I must have been hiding, though it pained me to admit it. There were sports on TV, but I wasn't paying attention. My thoughts kept returning to my marriage to Melanie. Why did it go wrong? When had she stopped loving me? I was sure she had fallen in love with me when she got married right out of college. We didn't break up all senior year. I proposed to her over Christmas break. She was majoring in physical education and health, and whenever my fraternity brothers saw her in workout clothes, they gave me a hard time. She had a combination of cuteness, trimness, and sexiness that was almost irresistible. I gave up trying as soon as I met her. We blended easily into married life. I got a great job in Atlanta, and she got a job as an instructor in an aerobics class. After a few years, we saved enough money for a down payment on a house and found what we were looking for in a new development called Eden Point. I thought we were truly happy here at Eden Point. I had gotten a few promotions in my company, and Melanie decided to start her own business. By then, we had enough money to rent space for her studio in one of the small shopping centers in the area, and her business was doing very well. Our savings account was growing. We made a lot of friends and acquaintances, especially in Eden Point, and we even talked about starting a family in a year or two. Our sex life had quieted down a bit, but that didn't surprise me. My work kept me busy and daily Pilates classes would tire anyone out. Thinking back on it, I began to realize that things had really slowed down in the last six months, although I hadn't noticed it at the time. I also remembered that Melanie seemed a little distracted at times, as if she was in another world. But when we made love, I felt better than ever, and I thought Melanie felt the same way. Obviously, I was wrong. I mentally kicked myself. How could I have been so blind that I hadn't realized she had another man? How could I not know that she had fallen out of love with me and fallen in love with Frank Calhoun? The only thing I could assume was that when you love and trust another, you don't look for signs of betrayal and deceit. No, I thought sardonically. You just have to wait until they hit you in the back of the head. On Monday, I went to work early to try to get ahead of things. Around 9 o'clock, I called my attorney's office and tried to make an appointment. When the secretary asked the purpose of the appointment, I didn't want to broach the subject of Melanie and me, so I told her that I needed to make some changes to my will. When she got back on the line, she said she could see me right after lunch. When I got to his law office, Jonathan met me in the lobby. He had been a classmate of ours when we were students, and I had approached him when Melanie and I had decided to make our wills. As we settled into his office, he looked at me with concern. Is everything all right, Michael? I understand you need to make changes to your will. You or Melanie aren't sick, are you? Thanks for your concern, Jonathan, but it's not that bad, I told him. Then I handed him the papers Melanie had given me on Saturday. As he read them, he tisk-tisked to himself. When he finished, he looked up at me. I'm sorry to hear about this, Michael. Do you think there's any chance of reconciliation? I don't think so. She's already moved out of our house and moved in with her boyfriend. She told me they plan to get married as soon as our divorce is final. He shook his head. I never expected this. You two seemed like the perfect couple. Then his expression changed, and his voice took on a professional tone. Given these circumstances, I, as your legal advisor, advise you to sign this agreement immediately. So just like that, ten years of marriage went to waste, said I bitterly. He shook his head patiently. In matters like this, Michael, you have to stop thinking with your heart and start thinking with your head. I believe Melanie has made you a very generous offer, much better than you will get if you decide to fight for her. She may be guided in part by guilt, but I'm willing to bet that the main reason is to give you an incentive to say yes as soon as possible so that she can marry her new man. Although it may seem to you now that you are inferior to her, in fact, if your marriage is over, that's the best you can hope for. I knew he was right. Hell, after what she'd done, I didn't want to stay married to her anyway. But it still felt like he and Frank had beaten me at a game I didn't even know I was playing. Jonathan's tone became sympathetic again. Look, Michael, I know the lawyer Melanie used. If you sign, we can file this settlement agreement in court very quickly. It'll document what she's offered. Then, if she gets remorseful and wants to come back, 
and if you're willing to take her back, you'll have 30 days to back out of the divorce. I knew that wasn't going to happen. Can I borrow your pen? I asked. Upon returning to the office, I immediately headed to HR. I needed to make a lot of changes to my health insurance, 401k plan, and a host of other spousal benefits. The clerk who assisted me must have done this a lot because he quickly prepared all the forms I needed. As I was signing them, I looked up and saw him looking at me. Guess I won't have to make an announcement in the office now, I thought wryly. In the evening on the way home, I stopped at one of the neighborhood restaurants and picked up dinner to go. But when I got home, I found that Melanie had been there during the day and had packed everything she wanted. Of course, all of her makeup was gone, but I was surprised to find a few articles of clothing left behind. However, upon taking a closer look at them, I realized that they were things she no longer wore. Guess I'll have to take them to Goodwill, I thought dejectedly. Further investigation revealed that the bedroom was not the only place she raided. Our good china was gone, as well as most of the serving pieces we had received as wedding gifts. From the kitchen, I noticed that dishes and a set of good carving knives had been carried away as well. Several pieces of furniture were missing, and when I went into the living room, I saw that large chunks of our CD and DVD collections were gone as well. Going through our things, I noticed that she had left our wedding album untouched. Somehow, that depressed me more than all the stuff she had taken with her. It was as if she wanted to erase all memories of her life with me. I went back to the kitchen and stashed the food I'd bought in the refrigerator. I had no appetite left after her intrusion. I made a mental note to myself to change the locks. Damn it! How can you go from a happily married man to a lonely divorced man in three days? I asked myself. I asked myself. It all seems so damn unfair. I spent the next week in virtual isolation, getting to work early every day and leaving late. The rest of the time I stayed in the house. The humiliation of having Frank Calhoun steal my wife from me was agonizing, and the fact that there was nothing I could do about it was almost unbearable. I confess I've had fantasies of attacks with baseball bats or brass knuckles. Sometimes I've dreamed of assassins and car bombs. But then I would return to the real world. Did I really want to destroy my own life to get revenge on a skirt-chasing jerk and a wife who couldn't keep her legs together? By Friday, I decided it was time to come out of my cocoon. I hadn't done anything wrong, and I had no reason to hide. I called Penny. Hey, partner, don't we have a tennis match scheduled for this weekend? I asked, trying to sound upbeat and positive. Oh, Michael, I'm so glad to hear from you, she said quickly. I thought about calling you so many times, but I decided that maybe you'd rather be alone for a while. Thanks, Penny, I replied, softening my tone. It's been a rough week. I told her everything that had happened, and then asked her what had happened at Eden Point that I had missed. She hesitated for a few seconds before admitting that our situation had been talked about all over the neighborhood. You'd think they could find something better to discuss, I said sharply. Maybe so, Penny agreed, but Frank and Melanie are having a hard time with it. They've been socializing at the club every night since last Saturday. Frank is almost openly bragging about whoever's the better man won, and Melanie hangs on to him like a lovesick schoolgirl. You could hear the anger in her voice. That's just disgusting, Michael. I immediately dropped her Pilates class and told her I couldn't be her friend anymore, she said. Her loyalty made me feel a little better. What about the others, Penny? What are they saying? I asked. I guess it's what you'd expect, Michael. There are those who are very unhappy with Frank and Melanie, and they try to avoid the lovebirds as much as possible. And there's a group that always revolves around Frank. They extol his valor, if you know what I mean. But for most people, it's just a sad, awkward situation, and they try to stay out of it as much as possible. Rationally, I knew that would be the case, but some part of me wished that society would tar and feather Frank and Melanie and run them out of town on rails. But I was determined not to let my disappointment hold me back. For what it's worth, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life underground, I told Penny. We have a game scheduled for Saturday, and unless you don't want to, I intend to take the court with my partner, I told her. I'm glad, Michael, she told me fervently. You can count on me. I intentionally went to the tennis courts a little late to avoid talking about topics I didn't want to discuss. It didn't help much. As I approached the tennis pavilion, I could feel the stares of my neighbors and teammates. I could understand their curiosity, but I still hated the feeling. 
Upon seeing me, the captain of our mixed doubles team rushed over to me. Michael, I'm really sorry. The other team made last-second changes to their lineup, and some matches have already started, so I can't change anything. If you don't want to play, I understand. What are you talking about, Mary? I asked. I don't understand. It's Frank, she said. You and Penny should play Frank and his partner. Oh, shit, I thought. That's the last thing I wanted. At that moment, Penny came over, and when she realized what was happening, her face went pale. She pulled me aside and whispered, We don't have to do this, Michael. It's no big deal. We'll just lose and play someone else next week. No, I said, loud enough for Penny to jump up. I'm not going to hide from that bastard for the rest of my life. I'm going to have to face him, and I'd better start right now. Penny looked at me worriedly, but I turned back to Mary. It's okay, I told her. Penny and I are here to play. It was a massacre. I was playing worse than I had in recent years, and my obvious emotions were affecting Penny as well. Frank, on the other hand, was on top of his game, and his powerful ground strokes were scorching the net like RPG projectiles. To make matters worse, he was constantly poking fun at me throughout the match. Come on, Michael, you can hit harder, he yelled after I executed a weak shot, which he smashed to smithereens. Another time he shouted, your wife can hit harder. Oh, wait, I was wrong. You don't have a wife. I just went ballistic. Besides, a crowd had gathered for our little match, and I looked up to see Melanie standing at the fence. To her credit, she grumbled at some of Frank's comments, but she didn't look in my direction once. At one point, I threw a weak second serve over the net, and Frank ripped it right at Penny. It bounced off her shoulder and almost knocked her down. I rushed toward the net with my racket clutched, ready to decapitate the bastard, but Penny grabbed my arm and begged me not to follow him to the net. It was a fair shot, she said. I'm fine, I'm not hurt. It's just part of the game. I looked at him with venom in my eyes as he pretended to tie his shoelaces. Eventually, I returned to my seat in anger and frustration. The final score was 6-2-6-1, a humiliating defeat. Gritting my teeth, I went to the net to shake hands with our opponents. Frank's partner seemed embarrassed by his performance and apologized after shaking my hand. Frank, on the other hand, simply walked over to us and, without bothering to extend his hand, said, That was a lot of fun. Let's do it again next time you feel like messing around. Then he defiantly turned around, walked over to Melanie and kissed her soundly through the waist-high fence. I don't know what Penny saw in my face, but she grabbed my arm and dragged me off the court. He's trying to provoke you, Michael. He'd like you to start a fight with him. Don't let him get to you. Please, for my sake. I sat down on the podium and someone handed me a glass of ice water. I took a few sips and then poured the rest of it over my head. I couldn't have felt worse than I had that day. I apologized to Penny for playing it so badly, and though she protested, I got in my car and headed home. I tossed my clothes in the hamper and dragged myself into the shower, sloshing water off me for half an hour. When the water finally cooled, I got out, wiped myself off, and flopped down on the bed, angry and disgusted. I knew why I'd lost. I'd let Frank possess me. That knowledge only made me feel worse. He'd gotten to me, and he'd gotten to Melanie, too, though obviously in a different way. Still, the result was the same, to turn a loser like Frank into a big winner. I vowed to myself that I wasn't going to take Frank's bullying anymore, and neither was Melanie's. I would find a way to break them both. I just had to figure out how to do it. I lay down on my bed and thought about what my old tennis coach used to tell me. Play to your opponent's weaknesses. That sounds good in theory, but how could I apply it to this situation? I know myself. Once I start working on a problem, my brain keeps attacking it, even when my mind shifts to other tasks. In fact, I've often found that if I leave a problem alone for a while, when I come back to it, I can easily find a solution. That's what happened in this case. I pondered the problem for a while, and then put it aside to spend most of Sunday finishing up the yard work I had neglected. By evening, I was so tired that falling asleep was not a problem. When I went to work the next day, I realized I had a possible solution. It will probably be expensive, I thought to myself, but if it works, it will be worth it. About mid-morning, I called one of our top salespeople. Hey, Jerry, I said, getting him on the phone. Any chance you'll have lunch with me today? My treat. Of course, Michael, especially if you're buying.
We met at a bar and grill I knew, which was a little dilapidated, but it had great food. After we ordered, Jerry looked at me. Hi, Michael. I was sorry to hear about you and Melanie. I thought you guys were doing well. Yeah, me too, Jerry, me too. But actually, that's why I wanted to talk to you. Of course, Michael, I'd be happy to help in any way I can. Okay, Jerry, then here's my question. When you entertain your best clients, have you ever had to use an escort? He looked at me strangely. No, Michael, absolutely not. It's against company policy and I would never do that. I leaned across the table to him. Jerry, this isn't a company matter, and we're not here on business. This is strictly personal, if you know what I mean. He stared at me for a few seconds, and then a light flickered in his eyes. Oh, I see, he said. I guess it's been a long, dry spell for you, with your wife splitting up and you not participating in dating and all that. He paused, then leaned closer to me. Sure, I know one of the best services in town. But listen, Michael, they only cater to the biggest players, you know? Their girls are incredible, but I think they might be unaffordable. I smiled at him. Let me worry about that. Just tell me how to contact them and what to expect. And over a burger and a beer, that's exactly what he did. After lunch, I nervously reviewed the notes I had taken during lunch. I hoped I was doing the right thing. Then I remembered how Frank had taunted me, how Melanie had announced with a cold stare that she was leaving, and I decided to act. I called the number Jerry had given me and a pleasant male voice answered. Hello. Can I help you? Yes, I would like to speak to Mr. Henry Miller, I said as I was commanded. This is Mr. Miller, the voice replied. What are you looking for? Something from Grove Press, I replied. Please state your name, sir. I considered using an alias, but Jerry explicitly hinted at the need to identify myself accurately. They're always worried about the vice police, he told me. They'll go to great lengths to make sure you're not a cop trying to set them up. I told him my real name. Are you calling from your office? asked Mr. Miller. Yes, I replied, but it's a personal matter. It has nothing to do with my company. I understand all that, sir. Now would you mind giving me the number of the switchboard where you work? Sure, I said, but wouldn't you rather have my direct line? No, he answered. I'll call the main number and ask for you. Then we can take care of your business. Pretty smart, I thought to myself. If he calls and the operator answers, he'll know he's calling a real company and not a police station. And if she transfers his call to me, he'll know I'm really an employee of the company. It's certainly not foolproof, but it's pretty good. I gave him the number of the main switchboard, and he hung up immediately. A few minutes later, my phone rang, and the operator transferred the call to me. It was Mr. Miller. He then asked for my cell phone number. This will allow us to contact you after hours if we need to, he explained. After I handed him the phone, he continued. Now that we've gotten rid of the identification procedure, he said, please tell us how our service can help you. I am looking for a very special companion who might be available for a number of occasions that might stretch over a month or more. Hmm, said the voice. That's a bit unusual. We don't usually commit to such a long period of time. We might be able to help you, but it will be expensive. He named a price that made my eyes water. I swallowed. It's going to be okay, Mr. Miller. Very well. Do you have any special requirements? Yes, I said. She must look like a goddess. He grinned. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, sir. But I think you'll be able to find a companion to suit your needs. He paused. Do you have a pen handy? When I assured him of this, he gave me their website address. I noticed that the URL started with HTTPS, which meant secure server. When I entered it, he told me to my amazement that when I was prompted for a username, I should enter Anias Nin. It then gave me a numeric password. Please understand, sir, that your username and password will be changed after you make your selection. This is being done for both your safety and ours. When I confirmed my understanding, he continued. Now about payment, sir. Once you make your choice and it is scheduled for the session, your credit card will be charged the amount you just agreed to. In addition, our clients should express their appreciation directly to our companions.
If you are satisfied with everything, we recommend paying a 25% tip. I made a few quick mental calculations. This has to work, I thought, or I'll be not only ruined, but humiliated. Very good, sir. When you are ready to make your selection, please go to our website. There you will be able to make all other arrangements. Good day, sir. After that, the line cut off. I waited until I got home in the evening to go to the website Henry had given me. The main screen only listed Capricorn services with the caption, We cater to the needs of the most discerning clients. Using the username and password Henry had given me, I logged into the site and a window opened in front of me that could have come straight off the pages of a Victoria's Secret catalog. All the women pictured there were so gorgeous that I wondered why they weren't working in modeling rather than the escort business. In fact, I even wondered if the photos could have been copied from some modeling site as part of some bait-and-switch scam. But my buddy Jerry insisted that Capricorn was real, so I decided to take my chances. I assumed I would choose a blonde, but a picture of a woman with shoulder-length dark hair caught my eye, and I impulsively clicked on Rhiannon. The confirmation that appeared on the screen assured me that Rhiannon would contact me within 24 hours to arrange our meeting. I was then prompted to enter my credit card information. When the card number and expiration date were verified, the screen went dark, and I was suddenly thrown off the site. Out of curiosity, I tried to access the Capricorn site again, but this time the welcome screen didn't recognize my username and password, and after a second attempt I was thrown back to the home page. I was impressed with the security of their system and thought this was an encouraging sign. If they went to this trouble, then perhaps their service is as good as Jerry claimed. All the next day I was on edge, waiting for Rhiannon to call. At one point, I even considered backing out of the deal. My little plan was going to cost a lot of money, and there was no guarantee of success. But when I went into the break room to get myself a cup of coffee, the two secretaries who had been talking when I entered immediately shut up and turned their backs on me. It didn't take a genius to realize who was the topic of their conversation. The pain of being the subject of office gossip strengthened my resolve. No matter what, I wasn't going to continue to be a helpless victim if I could do anything about it. It wasn't until after dinner that my cell phone rang, and when I answered, a melodious voice said, Hi, Michael, this is Rhiannon calling. I'm looking forward to seeing you. I swallowed and replied, suggesting we meet for dinner to discuss my request. When she agreed, I suggested the same grill where Jerry and I had dined. It was small, dark, and far enough away from Eden Point that I was unlikely to run into any of the neighbors. She laughed. How interesting. I don't think I've ever had the pleasure of dining there. I'll look forward to seeing you. With those words, she hung up the phone. Here we go, I thought. The grill wasn't too busy on this weeknight, which was one of the reasons I'd chosen it, and the low lighting also suited my purposes. But when she walked through the door, it was as if a spotlight had fallen on her. She saw me stand up nervously, walked over and shook my hand confidently. Hello, Michael, she said in her musical voice. It's a pleasure to meet you in person. She sat down and I followed her. I must have stared because she laughed and said, Well, how do I look? We've all seen movie stars on the big screen or models in magazines. They are gorgeous, but they are not real. But now I met one of them in person, and the impression was overwhelming. The young woman sitting across from me was simply stunning. Dark eyes, high cheekbones, plump lips, hair framing her face, an athletic but feminine figure. I could go on and on, but the fact remained that for a few moments I did nothing but stare at her in mute amazement. She smiled and broke the silence. I'll assume you approve, she said. Oh yes, I'm sorry, I stammered out. I was just… for a moment. My voice broke with embarrassment. Luckily, at that moment, a waitress came over to take our orders. I don't even remember what I ordered, but Rhiannon settled on a green salad with dressing on the side. As the waitress wrote down her choices, I realized that she too had fallen under Rhiannon's spell. She kept glancing at her until she finally blurted out, Aren't you on TV? Rhiannon smiled sweetly at her. No, I'm afraid not, she said, and the waitress left, muttering to herself. Their brief exchange allowed the rational part of my brain to engage again. I looked at Rhiannon curiously. I bet that happens to you a lot. She unconsciously nodded. Yeah, that happens a lot. Can I ask you a question? Why aren't you doing TV or modeling instead of, you know, I asked, hesitating a little at the end. 
I've looked into it, she admitted, but it's a very cruel world. I can look good, but I'm just one of many in this world. The odds of success are about the same as a basketball player getting into the NBA. But in this line of work, I stand out. And unlike modeling or acting, I didn't have to starve for years paying my dues. From the very beginning of the business, I was maximizing my money. By the time my looks start to wane, I will have accumulated enough money to live on my investment for the rest of my life. And if I'm really lucky, I'll find a rich man who wants a trophy wife, and he won't care what she did for a living. I couldn't help but nod. I didn't agree with the career she'd chosen, but she'd approached it reasonably. At that moment, the waitress brought our dinners. After she served Rhiannon, she looked at her again and said, Are you sure you're not on TV? I'm just sure I've seen you before. Rhiannon shook her head. I don't think so. If I was, I'd probably remember it. I tried to suppress a laugh as the waitress hurried away. As we began to eat, she looked at me carefully. So, Michael, why don't you tell me what's on your mind? Henry said it's something out of the ordinary. I blushed and began to tell her my story. When I recounted my conversation with Melanie after I caught her and Frank in bed, Rhiannon threw me a sympathetic look. That was pretty cold, she said. When I told her about Frank Calhoun and how he'd behaved, she nodded understandingly. I've met a lot of people like him. She wiped her mouth and folded her hands on the table. So what exactly do you want to do and how do I fit into this picture? I spent the next 15 minutes describing what I hoped to accomplish in the next month or so. When I was done, I admitted that I had a lot of doubts about what I was trying to accomplish. But I just can't sit back and let those two treat me roughly without fighting back. And now that I've met you, I'm starting to think it might work. She smiled broadly. What a lovely compliment, she said. Then she leaned forward across the table. You know what? I think I'm going to like this. Great, I said enthusiastically and reached out to shake her hand to seal the deal. She laughed and shook my hand firmly in return. To partners in crime, she said with a sly smile. Then she sat up and did something I hadn't quite caught on to with her body, and suddenly she was radiating raw sexuality. I realized I had a heart on. Well, she said in a low, sexy voice, now that we've finished the business part of our meeting, how about we move on to somewhere a little more comfortable to relax? My mouth was suddenly dry, and I had to take a sip of water before I could speak. No, I said, we just have to get to know each other today. She gave me a wry smile. You don't find me attractive? Oh, God, no, I stammered. I mean, yes. I mean, that's not the point. It's just that I'm trying to focus on what we're planning to do here, and it would be better for me not to mess with you like this. Don't you understand? But I have an extra for you. With those words, I handed her an envelope across the table. Earlier, I had put some large bills in it. She held it up triumphantly, and it disappeared into her purse. Then she changed her pose again, and her sexual side seemed to recede. I think maybe I understand, Michael. She tilted her head slightly to look at me. You're a very interesting man. I think I'm going to enjoy our little adventure together. With those words, she got up and left, and I was left sitting in the stall. For some reason, I felt wrung out. What a woman, I thought. We had planned for the first phase of Operation Honeytrap to begin on Saturday shortly after lunch. The temperature in Atlanta was already heating up, and I figured the pool at Eden Point would be crowded. I was a little worried about whether Rhiannon would show up, but shortly after noon, a BMW Z4 pulled up to my driveway. She came to my door carrying a small bag and, when I raised my eyebrows, said, My swimsuits. She looked around and smiled. So this is the suburbs. You like it here? I frowned. It was until recently. She stroked my cheek. We'll fix that. At the club, we split up to go to the changing rooms to change into our suits. As we'd agreed, I went out first and found two chaise lounges next to a table with an umbrella. No sooner had I made myself comfortable than I noticed the big Frank Calhoun heading my way. Well, Michael, he muttered, I'm surprised to see you in the pool today. I would have thought you were taking lessons from a professional and trying to improve your tennis game. I knew he was trying to bait me, but I answered him flatly. No, today my girlfriend and I are going to lounge in the pool and get some sun. Frank wasn't going to let me go so easily. Oh, you have a girlfriend now? I'd like to meet her. 
By now, our conversation had attracted the attention of everyone within earshot. That suited me just fine. Well, you're in luck, Frank. Here she comes, I said, pointing to the door to the women's locker room. Oh my god! There was silence among the members as Rhiannon approached us. I expected her to be in a bikini, but to my surprise, she was wearing a one-piece swimsuit. But somehow it was much more seductive. It was made of some kind of silvery material that reflected the sun and caught the attention of all the men and women. I heard a click and realized she was wearing stiletto shoes. They made her calves, thighs, and butt look amazing. As she approached us, I shifted my gaze from her feet to the suit. It looked different, and then I realized that it was made of the finest material I'd ever seen. It followed the exact contours of her body, and when I looked closer, it was obvious that the suit was completely unlined. It looked as if it had been painted on her body. She walked over to me and entwined her arm with mine, pressed her breasts against my bicep and kissed my cheek. Great, honey, she cooed. You found a place for us. Then she turned to Frank. Who's your friend, Michael? I glanced over at Frank and, to my delight, saw that his mouth was ajar as he stared at the vision before him. Rhiannon, I said. Meet Frank. Frank, this is my girlfriend Rhiannon. His mouth slammed shut, and he quickly extended his hand for a handshake. Welcome to Eden Point, he said rather grandly. If there's anything I can help you with, please don't hesitate. Rhiannon smiled sweetly. Oh, how sweet, she turned to me and asked tokenistically. Is everyone here as cute as Frank? I replied sharply. No, Frank is unique. She smiled at him again. Thank you so much for making me feel at home. When he remained standing still, she looked down with a smile. You can let go of my hand now. Oh, he said embarrassed. Well, I must be off. I hope I'll see you again, Rhiannon. I mean, I hope we'll see each other again. With those words, he awkwardly turned away and walked back to the other side of the pool, looking over his shoulder a few times as he went. I looked that way and noticed Melanie sitting with her arms crossed. She didn't look happy. Rhiannon and I settled into the chaise lounge. She took my hand and pulled me closer so I could whisper in her ear. I think that went pretty well. I squeezed her hand. You were perfect, I assured her. She smiled and gave me a quick kiss on the lips. I know she meant it in a friendly way, but I could still feel her lips 15 minutes later. Then she stretched out on the chaise lounge face down. Put some suntan lotion on me, will you, Michael? As I happily complied, I was sure I heard male moans nearby. For the next few hours, I think everyone who was at the pool that day tended to walk past us to get a glimpse of my new girlfriend. I know for a fact that all of my male team members stopped by, and after exchanging a few cheerful words, I made sure to introduce them to Rhiannon. She was gracious to each of them and chatted with them as if they were old friends. At one point, I leaned over and whispered in her ear, you should have gone into politics. She only smiled and winked at me. In my line of work, I'm only one step away from that. I chuckled. When all was quiet, she leaned toward me again. Which one is she? I knew exactly who she meant and pointed her to Melanie on the other side of the pool. All right, she said, leave it to me. She put on her high-heeled shoes and, clicking her clips, walked over to the side of the pool where Melanie was bathing. Bending at the waist to the pool, she removed her shoes from her feet and gracefully dove into the shallow water. Upon surfacing, she bowed her head forward and then quickly threw it back so that her hair formed a graceful arc over her head, splashing water in the air in a fan shape. I was totally enthralled. I'd seen this move before in commercials, but I'd never seen it in real life. It was amazing. Then, in one motion, Rhiannon gracefully floated out of the water and onto the deck. Facing Melanie with water running down her body, she threw her hair back, emphasizing her breasts. Then she put the mules back on her feet, adding four inches of height to her body, and walked back to where I stood watching. I reluctantly shifted my gaze from Rhiannon to Melanie. She looked at me angrily. Then she turned and addressed Frank sharply before grabbing her things and heading for the exit. He followed her, glancing over his shoulder at Rhiannon again. She settled gracefully in the chaise lounge with her eyes closed. I heard her mutter, mission accomplished. While we were there, only one unpleasant thing happened. As we were getting ready to leave, I looked up and saw Penny walking in my direction. Oh crap, I thought, 
I completely forgot about Penny's women's team playing today. What am I going to tell her? Hi, Michael. It's so good to see you outside again. Maybe we can meet up and play some more. She stopped abruptly as Rhiannon stood up and grabbed my hand. Oh, Penny said surprised. Who's that? This is Rhiannon, my companion, I said awkwardly. Penny blinked and looked at Rhiannon in silence for a while. Then she held out her hand. I'm Penny, she said. Nice to meet you. She turned to me again. I need to clean myself up. I'm pretty dirty after our match tonight. See you around, Michael. She then turned and ran off before I could think of what to say. Who was that? asked Rhiannon curiously. That was Penny Pennington, I told her. She's my mixed doubles partner. Interesting, she replied. I mentally berated myself for not thinking ahead about what to do with Penny. I didn't want to risk revealing my plan, but I didn't want Penny to get the wrong idea either. Damn it! Shortly after that, Rhiannon and I decided to call it a day. I felt like we had accomplished everything we wanted to do today. As we were leaving the pool, I swear I heard the level of conversation rise noticeably. When we got back to my apartment, I let Rhiannon use the shower while I dried myself off and reflected on the day. Except for the unexpected encounter with Penny, it had gone better than I'd hoped. I'd shown Melanie that I wasn't going to sit around and mourn her passing for the rest of my life. More than that, I showed her that not only could I not replace her, but that I had grown a great deal myself. Let her reflect on that for a while, I thought triumphantly. So how do you think it went? I heard a voice ask me from behind. Turning around, I saw Rhiannon standing there, wrapped in a bath towel. You were great, I replied enthusiastically. You were everything I hoped for and more. She did something with her fingers, and suddenly the towel slipped to her feet. Would you like to celebrate? She asked coquettishly. For a moment, I froze, unable to breathe. Everything about her was absolutely perfect. Her breasts sat high and proud, not huge, but well-proportioned. Surprisingly, her areolas and nipples were pink, not brown. There wasn't an ounce of fat on her. On the contrary, her abdominal muscles were well-developed and inevitably drew my gaze to her venous bump, smooth and completely bare. From there, her legs, strong and perfectly formed, seemed to stretch endlessly. I gasped and realized I was holding my breath. Pulling myself together, I stepped towards her, bent down and handed her the towel she had dropped. I'm sorry, Rhiannon. It's just not a good time. She smiled. Okay, I was just checking. She threw the towel over her shoulder and stepped away from me. Oh my God, how did I not get a good look at her ass before? When she returned, she was already dressed and had packed her bag. I handed her a sealed envelope. Thank you, I said fervently. Today was exactly what I wanted. She tilted her head amusedly again and looked at me. Do you want to go back to Melanie? She asked suddenly. I shuddered. No, I said firmly. This wasn't some one-off error in judgment or loss of control. She deliberately threw me away like junk she didn't need. I would never under any circumstances take her back. That's what I thought, she said. But I was just wondering. Anyway, are we still on for next week? Oh, sure, I said with a wide grin. During the week, I made sure to go to tennis practice at the club. I wanted everyone to know that I had stopped hiding. Glad you're backing out on the field, our team captain told me. My teammates greeted me with a pat on the back and a wide wink. Behind me, I heard someone say, lucky son of a bitch. I smiled. I knew the impression Rhiannon could make. A couple days later, I returned to the court for mixed doubles practice, but Penny was nowhere to be found. Our captain told me that she had called in sick. When I got home from practice, I called her right away. Are you okay, Penny? I asked. It's not like you to be sick. Oh, nothing serious. It's probably just a little bug going around. Can I get you anything? I asked. I'd be happy to get you some. No, she said sharply. I mean, thank you, but I don't want anything. Anyway, it's best if you stay away. I don't want you to get infected with what I have. Well, okay, I said hesitantly. But if you get worse, call me right away. I'm worried about you. She made me a vague promise and then said she needed to rest, so I let her go. I wasn't happy about it. Penny had always been so healthy and vital, 
It alarmed me to think there might be something wrong with her. And our little run-in at the pool last Saturday probably didn't help, I thought. I still felt like I couldn't tell her about my honey trap for fear of ruining things, but I just hated to give Penny the wrong impression. I hope she forgives me when this is over, I thought. The next step in my plan was scheduled for that weekend. The club was having a dinner and Rhiannon and I planned to perform at it. When she arrived at my house, she was dressed very differently from the last time we'd met. Wow, you look like you just stepped out of a fashion magazine, I said looking at her. She was wearing an ordinary outfit consisting of a skirt, a casual jacket, and a blouse. But although it all looked casual, the fabrics, styles, and accessories screamed haute couture. She curtsied like a little girl. Thank you, kind sir. Actually, Nordstrom's just got them, she said, but don't worry if you're not familiar with the labels. My main target today is the ladies, and one lady in particular. Well, I can't speak for wives, but I think you'll still have a great influence on men, I told her sincerely. As we pulled into the parking lot in front of the clubhouse, Rhiannon turned to me and said, We need to change tactics a bit today. We need to split up and socialize with everyone here. That will allow me to do what I need to do. Sounds good to me, I told her. As we entered the patio where the dinner was being held, I immediately realized that we were both right. Once again, most of the men were looking openly at Rhiannon. The wives were a little more reserved, but even from them I heard more than one comment about Rhiannon's attire that evening. A few of the more adventurous women asked where she had found her clothes, and soon Rhiannon was cheerfully exchanging shopping tips with them. After chatting for a bit, she and I went back to eating. Any luck? I asked her quietly. Oh, I've been very busy, she said seriously. I've been learning a lot about what wives think about the situation with you, Melanie and Frank. More importantly, I've been making your ex's life miserable. I was also flirting with her fiancé quite a bit, and she didn't like it one bit. I only grinned. It was obvious that Rihanna knew exactly what buttons to push. I was chatting with one of my teammates when Melanie walked by and pointed at me. Curious, I followed her to see what she wanted. When she turned to face me, I saw that her face was flushed with anger. Looks like you're wasting no time and getting back into the dating game, she said huskily. I didn't realize there was a mandatory waiting period, I said sarcastically. Yeah? Well, I don't think you're up to par on this one, Michael. Where the hell did you find her? I never met her when we were married. I met her through work, I replied simply. I'd be careful if I were you. She looks a lot more than you can handle. I couldn't help myself. You're wrong, Melanie. I practice with her every chance I get. Is that so? She said hotly. Then you had better keep her away from Frank. And with these words, she walked away. I smiled to myself. Everything was going exactly as I'd hoped. At that moment, I saw Penny carrying a tray of food. I knew she was on the entertainment committee, but I didn't know if she would feel well enough to come tonight. I rushed over to her and grabbed her hand. She blushed when she saw me. I'm so glad you're feeling better, I told her. You should have called me and let me know you felt well enough to come over tonight. I guess I wasn't sure until the last minute, Michael. Besides, I figured you'd be here with your new girlfriend, and I didn't want to bother you. At that moment, Rhiannon walked by, laughing and talking to one of my teammates. And I see I was right, Penny continued with a frown. She started to walk away, but I grabbed her arm again. Wait, Penny, we need to talk about our next match. She hesitated, then apparently made a decision. Michael, I've had a lot on my plate lately, and I've decided to drop the mixed pairs and focus on the women's team. I was shocked. You can't do this, Penny, I whispered. You're my partner. Who do I play with? Penny peered over my shoulder, and when I turned around, I saw Rhiannon standing there. You'll find someone, Michael, Penny said. Now please let me go. I need to put the food away. When I let go of her hand, she rushed away. Rhiannon took my hand and walked with me to a vacant table. Once we were seated, she leaned over to me and whispered, Just so you know, this girl is in love with you. What? No, that's crazy. She's my tennis partner. She was in Melanie's Pilates class. And if I'm not mistaken, Rhiannon continued, ignoring me, you might be a little in love with her too. No, I protested. You're wrong. 
She's just a good friend. Maybe, she said skeptically. Anyway, I think we've done all we can for today, so let's get out of here. When we got back to my house, I asked Rhiannon to tell me what had happened with Melanie and Frank. She gave me a smug smile. I walked over to where their food was spread out and sampled it, making complimentary remarks. Melanie was clearly not pleased by my presence, but there was little she could say. Then I told her how much I liked her outfit, and she was compelled to return compliment to compliment. This gave me the opportunity to tell her where I bought it. I realized that she recognized the clothes and realized how much the outfit must have cost. She didn't say anything, but her eyes were almost green with envy. That sounds like Melanie, I said. She's definitely into fashion and prides herself on her taste in clothes. Just then, Rhiannon continued, one of the other ladies asked Melanie to help her in the kitchen, and although she didn't want to do it, she had to leave me alone with Frank. As soon as she left, I went over and tried another sample of their dish. As she spoke, Rhiannon repeated her action. She made me hot. She straightened up and grinned, clearly realizing the impression she had made on me. Once I got Frank's attention, I started flirting with him in earnest. I asked him if he played soccer, and that gave him a chance to show off a little. While he was doing that, I walked over and stroked his chest. I commented on how much bigger he was than you and said I like big men. She giggled. I thought he'd do it right there at the table. Wow, said I. No wonder Melanie was so hostile. I'm doing the best I can, she said with obvious false modesty. And I can't believe Frank would believe you're hitting on him, I added. She smiled derisively. Guys like Frank are so self-sufficient that it wouldn't occur to them to question a woman's interest. The irony is that they're usually the worst lovers. I grinned. If what Rhiannon had said was true, it would serve Melanie right. I handed her the envelope. Do you think we're ready for the next stage? I asked her. Definitely. The dance at your club will be perfect for what we have planned. Then she turned and headed for the front door. What, no seduction attempts today? I asked with a smile. She grinned over my shoulder. I wouldn't have thought so. Then she turned and jerked her hips slightly, making my loins quiver. When she left, I opened a can of beer and sat down to think about what had happened. On the one hand, I was very pleased that the honey trap had worked. Even though Melanie didn't want me anymore, I knew she wasn't too pleased with how quickly I'd found someone to take her place, and even more upset that her replacement was so much hotter than Melanie would ever be. It was all very pleasant, but I couldn't shake the guilt I felt about the situation with Penny. Maybe Rhiannon was right, I wondered. Could I really have feelings for Penny? I had liked her from the very first time Melanie had introduced us. I'd found her attractive, slim, athletic, graceful, with an interesting, outgoing personality. But because of Melanie, I had always tried to keep our relationship purely friendly and tennis-like in nature. And I was sure that Penny wanted that too, especially while she was going through the loss of her husband. I thought about what Rhiannon said about Penny. It couldn't be true, could it? If Penny was interested in me, why was she avoiding me like the plague? And why did it bother me so much? For that matter, why was I constantly turning down the sexiest woman I'd probably ever met in my life? Could my feelings for Penny have been part of it? Eventually, I gave up and went to bed. I didn't know the answers to my questions, and even if I did, I wouldn't know what to do with them anyway. I decided that the best thing for me to do was to stay the course, focusing on the plan I had developed. The annual spring dance at the club was a popular event that always drew a large crowd. The ladies used the dance as an excuse to dress up, and the men reluctantly donned tracksuits, some even wearing ties. I was counting on Frank and Marlene to show up. I had warned Rhiannon about what to expect from her, and I was curious to see what she would wear for the climax of our plan today. So I was surprised and disappointed to see her get out of the car in jeans and a t-shirt. Sure, they were the tightest jeans I'd ever seen on a woman, and the t-shirt obscenely tight around her braless breasts, but I was still expecting something different. My face must have given me away because she stroked it as she walked past me. You didn't think I was going to risk my dress by coming here, did you? Just let me use your bedroom for a little while and then I'll be ready to go. I'd already put on my sport coat and pants, so I waddled impatiently across the room while she dressed. Damn, I grinned to myself. It's like we're an old married couple. A few minutes later, her voice reached me. Michael, can you come in here? 
I need your help with something. I went back and opened the bedroom door. Oh my god! Rhiannon was standing there in the sexiest lingerie I had ever seen. Her strapless bra and panties were a chocolate brown color with white lace trim that drew attention to the curve of her breasts and the sensual hollow between her legs. The stockings were the same dark brown color and were held up by a garter belt that further drew attention to her most intimate parts. She took a half step in her stilettos and turned around to reveal that her panties were actually a thong, revealing the full cheeks of her ass. She turned to face me again. Will I? She asked with a slight smile. I couldn't resist taking a step toward her, but she stopped me with a smile and a raised hand. No, no, not now. I can't afford for you to mess this up. So now that I have your approval, get out of here and let me put on my dress. I think I staggered as I walked back to the den. A few minutes later, she appeared. This time, she was wearing a strapless dress, the same whitish color as the trim on her underwear. The color contrasted beautifully with her hair. As she walked across the floor, I realized that the dress must have been tailored because the fabric seemed to flow down her limbs like water. With each step, I could clearly see the relief of her hips, and when she turned, her buttocks curved out in crisp detail. The slit in the side of her dress reached all the way up to the top of her stockings, and when she stood to the right side, her perfect leg was exposed to stunning effect. Of course, it didn't help that I knew exactly what she had under her dress. I swallowed hard. I think you might cause a few heart attacks tonight, I told her, and I wasn't kidding. She just smiled at me and held out her hand so I could walk her out the door. The club's patio area was cleared for dancing, and paper lanterns were hung overhead. It was a little gaudy, but I liked the effect of the soft lights and tinkling music. Rhiannon slid into my arms to dance, and I wasn't surprised to find that she was a much better dancer than I was. As we moved together, she rested her head on my shoulder, and in that moment I decided that I didn't care that she was a working girl. I just enjoyed the feel of her body next to mine and the pleasure of her company. She lifted her head and backed off far enough to look at me. You know, this suburban life isn't so bad. A girl could get used to it. Before I could answer, she tensed up. Uh-oh, battle stations. I turned and saw Frank Calhoun heading our way, dragging an obviously reluctant Melanie behind him. Hello, Rhiannon, hello, Michael, he muttered. Very glad you decided to join us this evening. How about we switch partners for a couple of dances? When I agreed, he whirled Rhiannon away, leaving me and a clearly uncomfortable Melanie standing still. I held out my hands to her. Would you like to dance for old time's sake? She reluctantly agreed, and when a new song came on, I started dancing with her. It was an interesting experience. I loved this woman and had been married to her for ten years. But after what had happened, all I had left in me was an intense desire to make her feel what she had done to me. So was our marriage really that bad? I asked. She sighed. No, Michael, it wasn't like that at all. We had a few good years and some good times. But then things fell into a rut. And after a while, I wasn't particularly excited about our relationship anymore. And when Frank came along and made it so clearly clear how much he wanted me, I just fell in love with him. I really fell hard, Michael. It was just like it was in college. She looked up at me. I didn't want to hurt you, Michael, but I had to do what was right for me. Can you understand that? I understand, I said bitterly. You've decided to switch. That's not what I meant, she defended herself. That's okay, I said. I switched too. She grimaced, remembering who I was dating now, and I felt some satisfaction. If everything went right from here on out, it was only going to get better. I looked up and saw Frank and Rhiannon walking toward us hand in hand. There's your date back, Michael, Frank said with a slight smirk. Have a nice evening. Then he strode away with Melanie struggling to catch up with him. Rhiannon and I continued dancing. How did it go? I whispered in her ear. You could almost hear the chuckle in her voice. The hook is well and truly set, she said. He's convinced I'm falling for him. He'll come up with some excuse for Melanie, and we'll meet at the club after everyone leaves. I'm just a little nervous about this part. The timing has to be perfect, I told her. Leave it to me. Women know all about that sort of thing. Then she licked my ear, and I flinched helplessly. As night fell, I noticed that the people began to thin out quickly. I must have been looking around because Rhiannon caught me. Sorry, Michael, she said. 
I guess Penny didn't show up today. Am I really that transparent? I asked her. Like glass, she said with a slight smile. When we got back to my house, I reached into my pocket and held out another envelope to Rhiannon. I may not get a chance to give this to you later, I told her, and I wanted to make sure you got it okay. She took it almost reluctantly, it seemed to me. She stared at me for a moment, and then her face changed. The sexy goddess had somehow disappeared, and what remained was a real, though still beautiful woman. This was the most unusual assignment I've ever gotten, she said, and you were unlike any client I've ever had. It was a little unpleasant at times, I blushed, but I enjoyed it immensely. I took both of her hands in mine. When I decided to get my revenge, I knew I needed someone with outstanding qualities, I replied. But I didn't expect to find someone like you, and I'll never forget you. I moved forward and kissed her on the lips. She held the kiss for a few seconds and then pulled away abruptly. She blinked her eyes rapidly a few times and then said hastily, No need to ruin your lipstick. Then she glanced at the jewel-encrusted watch on her wrist and added, It's almost time. We should get going. Give me exactly 30 minutes. With those words, she walked out the door, got into her car, and drove away. I stood for a moment, then made a decision. Rhiannon and I hadn't talked about it, and I hoped I wouldn't screw it up, but I had to take a chance. I pulled out my cell phone. She must have recognized my number. Michael, why are you calling at this hour? Penny, I'm going to ask you for the biggest favor of my life. Please don't ask any questions. Just meet me at the club in 30 minutes. What's going on, Michael? What does it all mean? Please, Penny, I begged. I don't have time to explain. Please, just trust me. Just come back in 30 minutes. I'm sorry, I have to go. I hung up the phone. Heading towards the clubhouse, I wondered if she would come. The chance was slim, but I figured it was the only chance I had. When I got to the parking lot, there were two cars parked there. I pulled out my cell phone again and made another call. Frank? Melanie's angry voice came through the phone. Where are you? It's not Frank, I said. It's Michael. Michael! What do you want, and why are you calling so late? She demanded. I'm calling because I know where Frank is. He's with Rhiannon. What? She shrieked. Where are they? Look, I said, just meet me at the club as soon as possible. Then I hung up. Frank's house was a few blocks from the club, but she must have run faster because I soon spotted her running through the backyard of someone's house. I intercepted her before she got to the club. Where is he? She raged. Quiet, I ordered, grabbing her wrist. You have to be quiet so we can catch them. I led her to the door to the club, which was unlocked, and we tiptoed across the threshold. As we entered the room, there were rustles and the rustling of clothes. In the dim light coming through the windows, I saw Melanie's eyes widen. I quickly clamped a hand over her mouth to keep her quiet, then pointed to the light switch on the wall. She nodded in understanding and we tiptoed over to it. I flicked the switch and the room was instantly flooded with light. With a startled shriek, Frank tried to rise, but his pants caught in his knees, causing him to stumble and fall to the floor. He jumped to his feet again, frantically pulling on his pants. Behind him, Rhiannon rose from the couch she had been lying on. Her dress was draped over the back of the couch, and as she rose, she pulled her bra over her bare breasts. She stood, clad only in her outrageous underwear, and there was no doubt in anyone's mind as to what was going on. I had to restrain Melanie as she started yelling at Frank. You bastard, how could you do this to me? We were supposed to be married. Rhiannon clung to Frank's arm, pressing herself against his back in the face of Melanie's anger. Now that he was wearing pants, Frank's confidence returned to him. He looked at me boldly and then turned to Rhiannon and asked her, What do you want to do now, baby? Oh, Frank, she replied in a little girl's voice. I just want to be with you. As she clung tightly to him, he hugged her protectively. Then he turned to face us again. Despite Melanie's distress, his first words were addressed to me. Well, Michael, it looks like you've lost another woman. I didn't say a word, but Melanie cried out. What about us, Frank? What about us? The big man turned to her. Look, Melanie, we had a good thing going for a while, but it was never going to last. Now I found someone better, and I'm going to devote all my time to her. He looked back at Rhiannon, then turned to Melanie. 
Can't blame a guy for wanting to switch, right? Even in pain and anger, Melanie couldn't help but cast a guilty look at me when she heard those words. Rhiannon turned and deftly put on the dress. Then she turned back and put her arms around Frank's neck. He leaned over and kissed her. Come on, baby, let's get out of here, he said, pulling her toward the door. You go, Frank, she said. I have something to tell Michael. Besides, I don't want to leave my car here. Look, I'll meet you at this bar. She reached into her purse, pulled out a piece of paper, and hurriedly wrote the address. I'll be right there with you, honey, she added, stroking the front of his pants and bestowing a passionate kiss on him. He looked at her doubtfully. Are you sure you're going to be okay? he asked. I'm sure, darling. Michael won't hurt me. He's not that kind of guy. Yeah, Frank grinned. I guess you're right. With those words, he walked out the door and we heard him drive away. While our attention was on Frank, Melanie managed to break free of my grip. She screamed, You bitch! and lunged at Rhiannon with her claws out. Instead of flinching, Rhiannon calmly stood her ground. As Melanie caught up with her, Rhiannon took a quick step to the side, grabbed one of Melanie's outstretched arms, and deftly twisted it behind her back. She winked at me. I knew self-defense lessons would come in handy. When Melanie continued to resist, Rhiannon told her sharply, If you don't calm down, I'll be forced to dislocate your shoulder. Melanie stopped resisting, and Rhiannon pushed her away to face her. Listen, Melanie, there are a few things you need to know, she said. I don't give a damn about your Neanderthal ex-fiancé, and I have absolutely no intention of joining him at the bar he's headed to. Melanie was stunned. But, but why? Why did I seduce him? Because that's my profession. I'm a paid escort. I've had dozens of guys like Frank. They all think they're God's gift to women and are always on the lookout for the next piece of ass. Do you think he loved you? The only thing he really loved was the opportunity to finally beat Michael at something. I'm sure he liked having sex with you, but he liked having sex with Michael even more. So Michael hired me to get a little revenge on Frank, and at the same time show you what it's like when a lover is unfaithful. It hurts, doesn't it? Melanie shrieked and lunged at me. But before I could react, a figure flashed in front of me and knocked Melanie to the ground. She stretched awkwardly on the floor. Penny stood over her with clenched hands. You deserve it, Melanie. After what you did to Michael, you deserve so much more. Melanie just lay there sobbing. It seemed to me that her feelings were hurt more than her body. Penny turned to face me and I could see tears streaming down her face. Is it really true? She asked me. She's really not your girlfriend? No, I told her solemnly. She was my partner in the honey trap we set for Frank and Melanie, but nothing more. But she's so beautiful, Penny objected. I could never compete with someone like her. Rhiannon walked over and put her hands on Penny's shoulders. Silly girl, I was the one who didn't stand a chance. He only had eyes for you. Penny looked at me again. So you've never even... Rhiannon stepped in again. No, Penny, he never did. I could never distract him from thinking about you enough for him to touch me. And believe me, I gave him that opportunity. Penny said nothing but looked at me with shining eyes. Rhiannon smirked at both of us. I think it's time for me to get out of here. I've had tougher assignments, but this has kind of worn me out. At that moment, Melanie picked herself up off the floor. What about me? Where am I supposed to go? I can't go back to Frank's house, not after what happened. Penny looked at her thoughtfully. I don't know what you're going to do tomorrow, but you can sleep over at my house tonight. I'm going to drive home with Michael. With those words, she kissed me hard. I took her hand and decided not to let go. But something kept bugging me, and I turned to Rhiannon again. What about Frank? Where did you send him? She laughed. That was the address of a gay bar I know. I wonder how long he'll be there before he realizes I'm not coming. Then the smile disappeared from her face and she looked at me intently. Good luck, Michael. You're a special person and I won't forget you. She leaned forward and kissed me gently. I felt Penny squeeze my hand even tighter. Rhiannon then turned to Penny and her face took on a fierce expression. You will treat him right, do you understand me? If I ever hear that you don't, I'll be back, and this time I won't take no for an answer. The fierce expression left her face, replaced by an expression I later realized was sad. 
She reached out and stroked my cheek. But I don't think I'll be so lucky. Then she reached into her purse and slipped something into my hand. Goodbye, she said, and then turned and walked out the door, her hips swaying magnificently. I looked at my hand. There were four unopened envelopes in it.